part. I feel like a cyborg. It's uh, completely equipped. <laughs> Are you receiving me? Perfect. <clears throat> Anyway, um, as Bart already introduced, I'm uh, working in a spin-off of the KU Leuven. It's called Transport and Mobility Leuven. Uh, at the time, they weren't very, let's say, uh, innovative in finding a name, but this is the name that covers also if you want to know anything about transport or anything about mobility. Well, the name says it all. Today, I'm going to first tell you a couple of minutes what we're about and what's my background, and then I will take you into the mysterious world of data science that's related to typical traffic analyses. Our company uh, is already quite a bit uh, has, through its merit basis, so um, we also are mainly an affiliation of uh, TNO, which is a Dutch research institute, so the combined uh, the two combined parties, they established what the spin-off company is. In contrast to what many people think, we are not subsidized, so we have to find our own money, bid for tenders and everything. We do have subsidies, but those we have to earn, like for IWT, for example, or the European Commission. The very interesting part is that everything that we do is open, so you can go to our website and nearly all uh, the reports are available. So if you do a study for someone, it's typically in, let's say, 90% of the cases fully available with all the details and the scientific methodology behind it. And this is very, let's say, it's welcomed because most of our competitors don't do that kind of thing. And it is not that we lose business secrets or anything because this is generally well-established methodology that it's about. And the most important thing that you need to understand about what we do or why we do it is this uh, in bold impact assessment. The question is always, we have a policymaker, he has a certain question, we try to devise models, we use these models, calibrate them, and then we can make uh, an educated uh, uh, result. It's not just about saying how, mu um, how much or how much better it is, but really quantitative numbers. So this is why we are really into data. Sometimes we also do stuff, but that's more of our personal nature, because there is data available. Sometimes the question isn't always clear, but there is data, and by looking at the data, you see a whole lot of possibilities exploding, and this is one of the things that I will show you today. Another thing is that we are very regularly featured in the press, so um, anything related when, for example, a, traf a truck on the ring road around Brussels uh, loses some of its cargo and it has uh, a jam as a consequence, then they sometimes call us to ask, how much does this cost to society based on the time that everybody loses? And these are one of the things that we are quite fluent nowadays in order to answer them. <coughs> Within our company, since uh, let's say a couple of years, three, four years now, we established what we call the data enrichment group. And the background is typically um, companies have a lot of data, but they don't always know what's the potential of this data. Take, for example, um, we had Toyota. They had a lot of data of uh, cars that they tracked every 20 seconds or something. We looked at the data and we looked at what the value business pos uh, proposal would be for them and what they would get out of it. And the interesting part is that by looking at one data set alone, that's interesting, but that's not as nearly as interesting as if you combine data sets. Now, I don't need to tell you about data fusion and stuff like that, but we're talking about very different types of data sets. And nearly all the problems that we need to tackle involve various kinds of data sets that need to be involved here. As an example of some of the things that we calculated is what's the amount of congestion um, based on what the, uh, the let's say the, the traffic detectors in the road concrete what they detect the number of vehicles the speed at which they pass we can uh, establish a relation between the number of vehicles passing by and the speed that they're passing by. And if you have the speed, then you also have the travel time. And you can use this to compare the typical travel time in a morning congestion hour to, let's say, the travel time at night when there is no congestion. And you can have this offset. And this offset gives you an indication of the time people lose. That's one part of the equation. The other part is how much does this cost to society? Every one of us, Let's say, if I ask you how, mu how, how much are you willing to pay in order to be one hour earlier at your work, or how much are you willing to pay for public transport in order to be one hour earlier on your work with respect to congestion, let's say for typical work-related commuting, that would be around 10 euro. For trucks, it's about 35 euro. It's the cost of the, it's the, the pay cost, uh, the wage of the truck driver, uh, the cost that whatever he's carrying in his truck is not 
in the store, but is still on the road and, so, and as such has no economic value. These things we can use to calculate what the total amount of money is that we would all lose when we are stuck one hour in congestion. So the equation then is fairly simple. You just figure out how much time do we all lose, with how many people are we, and what is the composition of traffic, trucks versus cars, let's say. And if we make a calculation about this, it's about 600,000 euro per day. In economical terms, this is an opportunity cost. So this is what we are all willing to pay. The concept behind it is quite economical, but the making, giving it a number makes it very tangible. And another interesting part is that if you look at congestion, most of the time when you hear about congestion, it's always on motorways. That is because motorways are sexy. Everybody knows the E40, the ring, the ring road around Brussels. No one knows about some local road near my village, for example, which is always congested. Uh, and I live in Kruisalten, which is away from where civilization actually started. So the thing is, it's only what is reported on the main motorway network. But that does not mean that we should neglect what happens on the underlying road network. And there it appears that, let's say, the, the time we lose there is almost four times as much as we lose typically on the main road network. This is actually a message that we want to get across to policymakers, in that they also have to look at measures for, uh, let's say, optimizing traffic flows on the more local routes. Uh, of course, Wallonia, they also wanted to have a bit of congestion, but it turns out that given the amount of congestion on the various motorways and given the amount of motorways within each of the regions, over 90% of it is located in Flanders. Now, where did this all come from? Before traffic flow theories and everything, there was a guy called Greenshields, and in 35, he stood with his uh, <coughs> camera, looking at a piece of road, and he figured out, ah, there are people driving here. So if there are not many people, then we go to the left of the graph, then they drive quite, they drive quite fast, so speed in miles per hour is between 40 uh, and 50 miles per hour. But as more and more people enter the road, traffic seems to slow down a bit. So we established a linear relation between them. And this is the basis from all traffic science that you know today in the world. Interestingly, this is a data set of around, I think, 10 or 11 data points. All of these points were gathered in the left upper corner, where you can see a small cluster of non-congested traffic. And then on a completely different day, on a completely different road, he figured out another point, which is in the lower right corner. So you could say these are not even the same uh, samples, but yet he combined them and we didn't care. <laughs> we have a traffic flow relation. And this linear relation is what we call the fundamental diagram of traffic flow theory. And it's based on these kinds of measurements. Now, um, a while ago they, were, they celebrated this, the, the 75th birthday of it. And if you go and measure what you see on the road, this is for example what is measured on the E17 in the direction of Antwerp. Horizontally you have what we call density. It just shows you how many vehicles are there on a kilometer. So if, it, if your uh, road looks like a parking space, then, there are, then it's very crowded. On the other hand, if there are not many vehicles that you count per kilometer, then it's not very uh, dense, the traffic. On the other hand, if you look at traffic and you see them passing by, for you it's like this, so they're driving by and the, the faster they drive by, you see more and more vehicles passing by. But then there comes a point where congestion occurs and you suddenly see a lot of cars, but they're driving more slowly. This point is located near the top of this, what we may call graph. Of course, this is what we truly measure. If we look at the graph, that the assumption that we make based on the relation that you saw before, it looks something like this. But not everybody is convinced that this is the correct shape. Some say it should look like this a bit. Depends on where you want to, let's say, um, put the clustering. If you, only if you cluster the data in two separate groups, well, you get one good group and then everything else. That's a typical problem. There are also German people who believe that this is completely wrong to have such a simple structure. It should at least be something like this with uh, uh, inflection points and everything, which cause a lot of problems in certain traffic flow models. These traffic flow models are based on partial differential equations. And depending on the type of function that you use here, you sometimes get vehicles that are driving backwards if you don't correct for these kinds of things. But we've been through all that. Ever since 2002, I guess, they, they solved most of the problems there. But it has been a, an interesting time before that. But it goes even further. Because if you look at traffic, what you see is that 
it goes, it goes, many more vehicles drive by, it goes very flu fluently, and suddenly, bam, everything stops. The reason is that when we drive closer to each other, uh, given our reaction time, we sometimes we can let go. For example, if the guy in front of you has his red lights, his stopping lights on, you don't necessarily need to brake. It might be a small disturbance, but as the disturbance gets larger, the effect grows. We talk about asymptotic st instability. The problem there is that at one point the chain might break. If the chain breaks, we have congestion. And this is like a zero-one event. It goes from no congestion to bam, congestion. But on the other hand, if you look at traffic going fluent again, it doesn't go from one to zero again, it goes intermediate. We call this the hysteresis phenomenon in traffic flow. And there are a lot of discussions about what is needed here. Uh, for example, if you have congestion on a road and you want to resolve the congestion, that means that a lot, of, a lot less vehicles have to be there. The, the traffic jams have to have the time enabled, uh, to be able to dissolve. Now, um, depending on which school of thought you abide by, some people say this, this is not actual reality. It depends on how you measure traffic flows. It depends on do you measure stationary things, like you measure congestion, or you measure free flow, but you do not measure like vehicles accelerating out of a congestion, for example. Depending on what you have there, your curve looks different because your point cloud looks different. So the sampling is very important here in order to define what you want or what you don't want. This is mainly a matter of belief in many cases. And in that respect, we are still not uh, out of the woods yet. So these were the first measurements. If we look at what's in reality, um, there was a company, um, Traffic, Traficon, in uh, the west of Flanders based, and they've been uh, bought by FLIR. They create cameras. They don't create cameras, they create software that drives the camera and they look at the image of a road and they look at the grey background, they subtract the background and based on the, let's say, the image uh, processing, they can figure out is there a vehicle or not. Based on these cameras, you can quickly estimate the number of vehicles driving by. Now we know that these cameras are not really perfect, so people, and especially the government, tends to rely on what we see on the upper right, double loop detectors. They're just two wires of uh, copper, let's say, and they're energized. And any time a vehicle, uh, if you energize the copper wire, you get a magnetic field. And any time a vehicle passes over these copper loops, let's say, the magnetic field changes because of the ion content within the car. And because of the change, you can detect it. And then you can calibrate these curves to figure out when did the vehicle pass the first curve and the second curve. So you can establish the speed and the time at which the vehicle passed by. You can also establish the length. And now in Flanders, they have uh, the motorway network completely um, figured out with fi every 500 meters, there are a couple of these things that you see in the road and they measure up to four types of vehicles and they combine them every minute. So every minute you get measurements from the speed, the amount of vehicles uh, and the, the class of vehicles. You can also work with lasers or anything. This is what, for example, the police use in order to establish uh, when you are speeding and that is based on the Doppler effect. These are the typical ways to gather classic traffic flow information. Once you have it, and this is some of the stuff that I played around with in my PhD and that everybody should play around with when you start with these things, you can just visualize them. And you typically see Monday, Tuesday until Friday, and then you have a Saturday and a Sunday. And you then see also very interestingly that on a Sunday, traffic gradually increases towards the night. This has to do with the fact that uh, there's a lot of night traffic visiting people. Uh, if you go to the look at the motorways near Leuven, you see a lot of uh, student traffic, let's say, or students that have to come to Leuven. You also see that on Saturday, there's also traffic, but a bit less, and there's no morning congestion, luckily for us. If you were to cluster this, it would easily give you these type of clusters. And it goes even further. We looked at data from a whole array of um, uh, detectors. We saw what was in the data, and then we let all the clustering methods that we knew loose on this. And this way we could figure out what is the optimal way to cluster this kind of traffic flow data. And I think um, this is based on an, a time aggregation of five minutes. So every five minutes, you have a new measurement of the total amount of vehicles and the speed at which they're driving. And you can use this information to automatically cluster. What you typically see, though, is that the weekends are very clearly uh, identifiable, but what happens within weekdays, that's a bit more difficult. So there might be other types of measurements that you need in order to differentiate what is going on on a Monday versus a Friday. 
typically uh, they say on a Monday uh, you have a large morning congestion, on a Friday you have a large evening congestion. These are the things that you see, but not based as such on these kind of measurements, but more on measurements of uh, congestion length and stuff like that. Once you have that, you can draw heat maps. And if you look at uh, the center image, you see the ring road around Brussels. Suppose I take this road and I stretch it. Then instead of vehicles driving around the ring, they're driving from, top to bo uh, from bottom to top. And, because ta and what we do is we set time on the horizontal axis. So vehicles drive from the bottom to the top and they drive from the left to the right. And what you see is that this blue, bluish, that's the speed. They drive at a very high speed, which is logical because at, let's say, 10 or 12 o'clock, there normally isn't any congestion. But these highlighted areas, these, uh, let's say, yellow spots, they indicate lower speeds. And so we can use these kinds of measurements of more than one detector to figure out where is the congestion located in time and space. These are hence called time-space diagrams, and they're the basic tool to understand what is going on within traffic flows, uh, let's say, from a dynamic point of view. And then we can go on. We can calculate, as I told you earlier, the amount of time we lose. For example, the curve you see horizontally is the amount of vehicles that drive past a certain point, or in total, let's say, and vertically is the travel time they need. And to the left, we have this, this black cloud. That's typical nighttime traffic. Not much traffic with a quite low travel time. But as you enter the morning congestion, I think it's this, these blue dots upper right, you see that there are a lot of more vehicles driving by and they're driving at a much higher travel time. And what we then do is we draw this curve in between and we say, well, this is our model. We can then say, give me any amount of vehicles and we'll tell you what the travel time is. And this is then used uh, in various studies all around the world. Uh, and the clue is to have these things calibrated. But you can immediately see that calibration here is, of course, not that easy. Where do you put on the left side? It's easy. But to the right, do you put it higher, lower? We are now underestimating the morning congestion and a bit overestimating the evening congestion. So this is not even a true curve that you can use to distinguish between the morning and the evening rush hour. But it might be useful if you look at a year traffic, all traffic in one year, then you may use such aggregate measures, let's say. To the right, we have uh, another interesting curve. Suppose you live in Brussels, uh, and uh, suppose you live in Leuven and you work in Brussels, then every morning you have to go through congestion and in the evening back again. So one of the things we did was, how much time do you spend in your car in a jam? And it appears that people doing that, living in Leuven, working in Brussels, are worse off. Half of their time in their car, they are stuck in congestion. But because the trip is not that big, the time they lose is not as much. So on the other trajectories where the travel time is longer, you spend a lot more time. But relatively seen, you spend less time in congestion. This is something that indicates where the, let's say, the potential bottlenecks are and where people need to take action. Look at um, average speed control. Your uh, license plate is scanned. Uh, at the E40 near Alst, uh, Erpemere actually, and it's scanned again near Wetere. And based on the time difference and a match in the database, they calculate the travel time you had. And based on the travel time, you can know is the guy speeding or not. And one of the things we figured out with uh, data, very fine data, two years of data, every five minutes, all the speeds and all the amounts of uh, the numbers of vehicles, we could clearly see that once the average speed control was in, in effect, we saw that the number of violations typically dropped. So depending on how fast you are speeding, you get a light violation, minor violation, or you get a real speeding ticket. And you still see, interestingly, that some people still persist, which is good for the income of the <coughs> Belgian government. On the other hand, it's not good for them because they get uh, uh, busted each time. Of course, all this data is only as good as we think it is. So if we look at the quality of the data, there are huge differences. Um, this is just an idea. All the traffic detectors are lined up horizontally and every day in the year is put vertically. And depending on the color, you have a problem. So if there are black lines, that means black vertical lines, that means that um, all traffic detectors had a problem in that day of the year, which is very unlikely. So there's probably a problem within the database itself. Now, if you looked at the data, I saw that the data was getting progressively worse from 2001 to 2005.
But then they started switching to double loop detectors. Rem remember that Belgium originally had single loop detectors, which is old technology and not good at all. And they make huge estimations uh, that you won't even dream about to put into a model. But the data was getting worse and worse. And they were also not, let's say, um, helping in that sense. So they decided to install new detectors. So this quality control is now very important. Within the government, they have a, a very dedicated group only looking at, is our data good enough? And if you ask them, it's not good enough in order to share it. But we as data enthusiasts, we believe just share it and we'll do the data cleansing or we'll look at what is necessary in that case. Remembering Bartomor, our previous professor, he always said reality is just another model. Did you know he was right? Depending on what you put in your model, what kind of data, you get certain <coughs> results. Do not just believe the models, especially traffic flow models that are being used to calculate whether or not the Oster wheel should be closed or not. Will there be congestion on the ring road around Antwerp? Well, all these, these kinds of models, they're typically wrong because the data underlying them is not correctly uh, used. The calibration is faulty. Uh, the model just makes the wrong assumptions about reality. So you have to be very careful, careful when interpreting these results. Now, today is also not just about data, but it's about getting really big data. There were the days when, when we wrote a proposal, we had to put the word sustainable in it. So if your uh, project had the title sustainable, you got funded because sustainability is important. That has changed a bit. Now you just need, you do not need to be sustainable anymore. You need to be smart. Yeah? Smart cities, smart traffic, smart planet, everything like that. And so the next trend now is getting this big data involved, crowdsourcing, stuff like that. So we are actually <laughs> in a trend that is growing and growing and where more communities are participating. If you want data, well, there is data, big data, but traffic typically at the moment is not big enough. If you want to have really big data, then you should go to CERN or you should go to uh, the data coming out of a Boeing 747. In one flight, it has more data than what we gather in one year of traffic flow data, for example, for the entirety of Belgium. So it's a bit relative, but things are changing depending on what kind of measurements you are looking at. For example, if you look at uh, people driving, these are all uh, employees from Toyota and we follow them every 20 seconds of their life in their car. And we did that for over one year. There were about 300 people. And you typically see how the morning peak arises and where they are driving. Of course, Toyota is located within the center of Brussels, uh, near Diem, more, uh, more on the side, actually. So we saw how people are driving by. We see where typical bottlenecks occur because we see their speeds dropping. For example, this is the ring road around uh, Brussels. The bluish color is the high speed, around 120 kilometers an hour. But the more the redder come, the more the color turns red, the more congestion sets in. And this is quite detailed data because we followed everybody every 20 seconds. I knew that when they were parking in the evening, they always parked in the vicinity of their house. Not exactly at the same spot, but you can draw a correlation between all these clusters of data points. And then you can easily pinpoint where the people are living or where they are working. And this is very insightful, not from a, let's say, privacy perspective, but more from what is going on. How, is, how are people behaving on the roads? How are, is our mobility behavior? And for that, this is quite interesting. It goes even further. Um, suppose that we all stop using the car and we switch to public transport, then there is a problem because we, uh, we created a model and the model said, okay, let's now, knowing that someone goes first from here to here and then from here to here and then to here to here. So uh, you drop off kids, you go to your work, you go to the store, pick up kids and go back home. These trips, if you want to do them by public transport, you have to take into account that you have to have transitions. Uh, you have uh, travel time, you have, have connections, things like that. It's not always possible. So depending on the scenario that you have, optimistic or realistic, we see that only one in eight in 12 trips can be replaced. So the 8% means that of all our journeys that we do on a daily basis, only one out of eight can be, let's say, uh, switched to public transport as it is today. The lesson here is that we should not only uh, invest in public transport and change that, but also that we have to change our mobility behavior. If you step away from the car, you cannot just be anywhere, anytime. You can't even do that nowadays. But, and there are a lot of other things that you can do. Um, 
And the really big data comes from, for example, these, these green clouds. Those are all the Twitter feeds that you get at one point in time. Then you see where all the people are. You see how they are moving. So you can all follow this. We have Bluetooth scanners. You can do anything with that. They use it for cars. They use it also at festivals to detect uh, pedestrian movements. Are people crow crowded at, um, let's say, the main stage, or are they going to the to the the, the rest? Uh, what's called the bars or stuff like that? You can all get this from the data, and this is the really big data because there's quite a lot of it. And of course, we are moving further and further. In your car, there is something called the CAN bus. It's a standard, and everything that your car does is put on this bus. The bus means um, a communication channel, like in the early PC. And what you get is that um, if you steer to the left, the amount of steering is also put on the canvas and it's locked. And you can buy a simple Bluetooth transponder from, let's say, China, put it in your car, connect it to your tablet, and then you, in real time, see what is going on. Uh, there's, of course, standards and everything, but it also allows us to figure out how is your acceleration behavior. So we can pinpoint when people are not eco-friendly driving, when you are overdoing it. If you're continuously hitting the gas pedal, if you're always braking instead of coasting, things like that, uh, it rise, your fuel consumption rises and we can learn techniques in order to have a lower fuel consumption and a more economically viable uh, trip, let's say. And this is based on this kind of detailed data. Going even further, this was, a, let's say, a side effect of one of the experiments we did. We figured out where people were driving in Leuven and you can see where the, we have a zone 30, what is going on within the zone 30. I also saw people speeding within this zone 30, individual people. So this is actually very interesting data to, let's say, sell to the police in the sense that they can now figure out where the, the hotspots are, where more traffic uh, is, where traffic is more unsafe than other locations. What they typically do in Belgium is uh, to figure out where we are all going is they ask us. They just ask, let's say, in a census of 1,000 people, where do you work, where do you uh, live, how many times a day do you use a car, for how many trips, what's the typical distance, blah, 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 blah. Just follow these people within their car, log everything, and you get all these questions answered automatically, purely from the data, and much more than you would originally uh, have. So this is why these travel patterns are actually buried within the data, but you can easily get them out, given that you have the data. For example, we did an experiment with road user charging. It's uh, high on the agenda from time to time, depending on the type of government you have. We did an experiment between Brussels and uh, Leuven, and we saw that people changed their behavior. So they got this uh, small onboard unit in their car. It measured their position. It also told them, if you drive on the motorway in the morning congestion, this is the amount you will have to pay per kilometer or vice versa, if you drive on a local road or in a city in the low hours or in the peak hours, this is the amount you have to pay. And the idea there was that they will be incentivized to spend less money. So money is there the incentive in order to um, change people's behavior. And what we saw from the data from our test participants is that uh, they, they drove less in the morning. So the blue curve is before and the red curve is after uh, the kilometer charge was put in place and we see that people actually drive for lower costs. They drive also more during the day and they drive a bit later in the evening. Of course, this is a small sample uh, and the people were willing to participate in our experiment, so it's a bit biased. But this is why the government made a new um, effort in order to have, I think, around 1,000 people followed within their car, but the results aren't nearly as satisfying as these are. And from what, I, what a little bird told me is that they will continue with the experiment until they get the answer that they're actually seeking, which is also interesting because then as long as they're tendering, <laughs> we are happy to bid. <laughs> we also have parking management. This is the next big thing. Um, you can just look at parking spaces on, in, in garages. They can have detectors in place to tell you there are this many uh, vehicles uh, within the parking garage or there are this many parking spaces left. Or we can shift and we can say, we look at um, every SMS that has been sent in SMS parking and we can just look when in time are these SMSs occurring. Then we fit a statistical model on top of this and then we can say with, let's say, 95% prob probability that you will have a parking space within the center of Leuven at around 12.05. 
depending on the data that you get from this. This is quite interesting and it doesn't need uh, very detailed sensors in the co concrete or anything. You can just do this with existing data. Um, more or less concluding, what you also have is a uh, potential for electrical vehicles. Now, an electrical vehicle is quite expensive. So the question is, should the government change its fleet park and electrify everything? Then the question becomes, given that an electrical vehicle needs to be charged and has a finite action uh, range, it can drive, let's say, 400 kilometers and then it has to charge for two to eight hours. It depends on your behavior. Are you someone who makes a lot of small trips? Do you make a lot of long trips? Do you make uh, less small trips, etc., etc.? And depending on the behavior that we see, we can figure out, well, this is the zone in which um, there is enough space, uh, there's enough time for the battery to charge, and the distance is small enough so that it fits within one battery cycle. And based on this, you can make an educated guess on whether or not your fleet can be electrified given its usage, which is a very important parameter here. And nowadays we are involved in anything related to autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you thought you had a lot of data, then these things, they can do a lot more. For example, when we see a traffic situation, we scan it one second, one and a half seconds. These kinds of things, they measure uh, with their LiDAR uh, detector, they measure every thousandth of a second, for example, the entire uh, vicinity and everything is locked. And this goes really, really far. And what we are now doing in a project with Flanders Make is developing a self-driving bus. It will go very slowly in the beginning. These things typically drive 20, 30 kilometers an hour. But we are going to figure out what are the typical traffic safety interactions that people encounter. What if children jump in front of the bus? How does the bus detect this? What will be the consequence? And of course, all the ethical questions related to, which has been in the news, for example, should the bus, uh, should your autonomous vehicle drive straight onto uh, a group of 10 children crossing the pedestrian walkway, or should you smack your vehicle into the car and kill the driver in order to save these 10 children? Ethical issues, they're all abound. And I think this fits in well with the previous presentation in a sense. There is a lot of new uh, route planners coming uh, into play and we see a trend. The trend is not just to have multimodality per se, but also to have all the ticketing involved. So I want the route planner to know and to, to tell me the amount of tickets I need in order to take the bus or the train or to have a connection. I will also buy them from my smartphone and I will also validate them on the uh, bus via uh, NFC communication, for example, via the chip within my smartphone. And this is the, the thing that is going on nowadays more and more. And of course, where would we be without um, at least the ethics behind all this data? I told you already about where the people live and stuff like that. In road user charging in the Netherlands, they are typically always a bit ahead of us. What they originally said, like either you have this onboard unit that transmits all the information to a backend server where it's aggregated, or all the calculations are done within the onboard unit and they never leave. The, the personal data never leaves the car. There are two different things, different costs as well. And in the Netherlands, they decided in the end to have every calculation being done within the vehicle so that sensitive personal data is not exiting and being stored in another database. It depends on where you want to put the focus. But here there are a lot of techniques. Uh, people are now talking about privacy by design. So during the construction of, let's say, the, the, the chain of where data goes, they already put, uh, let's say, guarantees in place that data cannot be just combined or reused or uh, whatever. They have obfuscation techniques, things like that, encryption, of course, so this is very important. And the point is, there's a difference, because it's something I also want to say. Privacy is what you allow people to do with your data. Security is how the data is actually being transmitted and secured, in a sense. There are two different issues. In nine times out of 10, when people have a problem with the privacy, they actually have a problem with the security. The privacy is quite okay in that sense. And what we see nowadays is that all data is being opened up. This is not just uh, of goodwill. It is actually mandatory, required by the government, by the European Commission. There are a lot of these uh, directives, for example, the PSI directive requiring all our public transport operators to release their, public, to release their uh, data which is not always easy because we also work for Infrabel, for example, and they have a lot of data sets in there and <laughs> opening them up, that is not, that's not never going to be the case. But there are a lot of interesting cases where this might be uh, useful. And if you go one step further, 
smaller cities are also, even Brussels, they're opening up their data. They're organizing hackathons. They put the data sets online, like these are the real time parking space occupancies. So we know at every parking garage in Ghent, the amount of vehicles at any time of the day, real time. Do something with it, make an app, make it useful for society. And then we see society entering the picture and also making sure that these apps are really being used and they are reshared and rebuilt and everything. And this is going quite far. And this is more or less the future for this uh, data in the sense that there's a lot of data now and we have these, let's say, crowdsourcing more or less and these crowds that are also entering the, let's say, the field. And they provide a lot of new information to cities or to local governments. So if you have questions, we'll talk now. <laughs> And uh, you can always visit our website and get more insight into everything. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Are there questions? Peter. Uh, I, uh, do you have any difficulties when, when, when you have these double groups, these uh, double groups in Flanders or something? But do you also have them in Brussels and in uh, Bologna? Yeah, the, the, well, no, that's to say, uh, it's regional. So what happened in the past was that the single loop detectors were everywhere, both uh, Walloon and Flanders, let's not talk about Brussels for a second, and they sent their data to the federal government, and so we obtained data from the federal government. But these contracts have stopped, so if you want data from Flanders, you go to the Flanders government, if you want them from uh, Wallonia, you go to the Walloon government. For us, it's easier to obtain them from Flanders than from Wallonia. I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. Brussels is more open in that sense, so they are more inclined to share their data. But Brussels does not have any motorways or anything. They just have, they have four kilometers officially of roadway on the ring. And for everything else, they have these new detectors in front of traffic lights. But they are not, let's say, usable. They count the amount of vehicles. They figure out when traffic lights synchronize or switch. And you can use that data if you do a project with them to have smart and intelligent traffic lights, for example, or to have a traffic computer. But outside of that, that data is not really used. And it's also thrown away every, I think, 30 days or something. Do you have interoperability problems between Bologna and Flanders? Do we have? Interoperability No. <laughs> They're completely different data sets. Yeah. So if you want... So uh, you have a combiner Well, it depends. For example, Interoperability that talks about the standard in which you obtain your data. This is a good question because how is the government going to give you the data? Are they putting a feed via a web service or are they just sending you a CSV file or a text file or whatever? Uh, the Belgian government, typically, the Flanders government gives you a, a text file. It's a large dump with whatever you request between it. But they're changing this in light of this open data. They're changing it in, in probably to have a lot more automatic process that you do not have to fill in a form and everything. Flanders, uh, I'm a project right now with the Flanders, and they actually uh, plan to open, uh, open up the raw data of the sensors uh, by, uh, by Q4. Yeah, the good thing is we developed the quality control system within it, and so typically you have raw data, you have validated data, of which you know that's okay, and then you have reconstructed data. That's raw data that's not validated, that, that's validated but fixed. And they typically are not, yeah, you can choose whatever you want, but you still have to ask them. And uh, they're not, they used to be not so keen on sharing their, their raw data because the government initially typically says, I only want to give my data when it's good enough. This has stopped and now you can get the data feeds. And this is one of the processes they're actually doing in the Flanders Traffic Center. What sort of analytics tools are you using? What? What sort of analytics tools are you using? Okay. From data -based? Um, if you do custom programming, it's in Java and stuff. Uh, if you do, um, a lot of it is in Excel, but because not everybody is well versed in all the other tools. Uh, we use MATLAB very uh, often. Uh, parts of it in Simulink, because we're now with these autonomous vehicles, so they have vehicle models within them. Then we have custom built programs in CADIS that do more or less optimization problems uh, for what I tell you here is about this percentage of what our company does in the field of mobility. So, um, and then there's also a bit of, uh, let's say, custom C++ depending on if you have a client or something, and a bit of scripting, but not that much. 
<coughs> and then the Stata S plus and then the usual uh, stuff. What about those uh, sort of motion charts that you use for Toyota Europe? Uh, Showing the, the dots uh, going around, is that uh, something special? Or? Motion chart. Well, they be uh, the dots that were moving. Uh, ah, uh, this is raw data yeah. uh, plotted on a map, and then we generated frames. This was actually done in MATLAB. You just write a script, you get the data, you uh, combine everything, you, you group it depending on the type of uh, you that minute of the day, all the locations, and you plot them, you adjust the colors and you generate frames, and then you convert them into a movie. That's custom stuff. Because most of the studies about this kind of data, let's say that this is the amount of time you put in analyzing, and this is the amount of time you put in preparing everything. And I, I don't think we are not succeeding in cutting down on this time. So anytime you get a new data set, the whole story starts again. I've seen people giving me GPS data in which the, the decimal dot was also a comma. So if you have a comma separated file, winter summer hour conversion, wrong. The wrong kind of longitude latitude coordinates, uh, miles instead of kilometers per hour, things like that. Projections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as it is as best as possible, we make a model of it and then we use the model to change some of the, let's say, parameters within. And we can feel quite safe in the results because the modeling assumptions are as simple as possible and as uh, realistically as possible. Basically the tool always is modeling. If you do a scenario analysis, you do a prediction for 2025 we know that traffic increases, the amount of traffic increases, so we estimated the trend at which it increases, and then we feed our models based on a calibrated base here, which is new traffic demand, and we put the demand, all the traffic, on the network, and then there the model figures out where, do all the peop where are all the people driving. This is a typical approach. This is what, for example, is used for Austria, whether or not it will affect, will the mega say have effect. This is exactly done with these kinds of models. So the modeling assumption is there very important. Do you have an idea of how the uh, self-driving cars will impact the capacity of those? Well, we get that task from time to time. It depends. Um, it, it depends on the mixture of autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. Uh, an autonomous vehicle can drive in principle very close to its predecessor and there won't be a problem because the predecessor, if it's an autonomous vehicle, no and they can react on a millisecond basis. So there we say high capacity. On the other hand, driving like this, that means that you still have a chain, and if the chain is changing because of uh, slowing down or anything, it impacts vehicles further down. And then an interesting part is what about um, the comfortable feeling. If you want to have the same comfort as you have in a train, then all the accelerations have to be much smoother. I don't think we accept our autonomous vehicle if it's like always doing like this and we won't feel safe in it. So I think the impact on capacity will be more dictated by these kinds of uh, constraints than by pure technology itself. That doesn't mean that you can have high, uh, they call high capacity lanes where autonomous vehicles can enter the lane and only autonomous vehicles are allowed and then they can speed up. And this is something that people are looking at nowadays. But as long as there's a mixture, capacity will be a, a worse problem than, uh, than Okay, perhaps the last question if somebody wants. <laughs> Do you have specials? Okay. Do you also combine the uh, data of the people who have the car, where they live, where they have to work, and make prediction? Yes, this is. Expect more or less? This is one of the first things that's typically done in a classic uh, traffic model. It's called a transportation planning model. They figure out where are people working, 
what is the attraction to work there, given a certain sector. They look at where our people are housed, and then they make a, a, a model that, dis, uh, that distributes how many people from this, from Antwerp, for example, are going to work in Brussels. And then they figure out uh, which ways are they taking, and then they figure, uh, they figure out also what type of transport are they going to use. So this is a typical classical model that's being used. Yeah, the problem is that you have to divide your landscape into small zones, and you have to figure out how much traffic enters each zone and exits each zone. And these models are not that accurate. So this is why the pure data in that is not always perfect. So on the motorways it's quite easy to calibrate because you measure the vehicles, but on a small road near a church, for example, you have no measurements, the model can tell you anything it wants to. So for these kinds of things it's more sensitive. Do you have data on the occupancy of a vehicle, number of people? Yeah, the that, that data is based on uh, questionnaires. And it's around 1.2, I think, depending on the year and the region that you uh, allocate. And it's collected by the government. Okay, only by sampling, uh, sampling with, question, with questionnaires. There yeah. is no, not another easy No, it's, there, there way is nothing fancy like a camera that's in the States, they have high occupancy lanes, and you can only drive in that lane if you are with more than one person in the car, and they monitor this via cameras. This is one way, but we don't have that at all. And with the mobiles, the number of mobiles, something like that? Yeah, but that data is uh, owned by the telco operator, and yeah. it's quite expensive for one, and uh, I don't think they use it for these kinds of purposes. They only use it for when there's legislation. Okay, um, let's take an example, road user charging, in which you have an onboard unit in your car and you have your personal identity. These two need to be linked. That linking, that's a question of security. It's a question of where does the data being recorded by the device goes to? In what format is it being recorded? Is it being transmitted? Is it a secure channel? If it enters the database, is it a central database or are there two separate databases? Who has access to these databases? Is it only the police that can access both and find your identity based on your behavior and vice versa? Or can anybody do it? This is more a security debate and the, part, the last one is privacy. And privacy is what you're willing to concede. By using a cell phone, you implicitly give, a bit, give up a bit of your privacy. So um, by Bluetooth tracking, you give up a bit of your privacy. So this is a choice that you make as an individual which is also legislated, of course. In any project we do, we need to inform our participants that they are being tracked and that their data is used for scientific purposes only. This is, uh, <laughs> there's a difference. Okay. Okay, thank you again, Sven, for the very good presentation. I fear that we have to round up on this one, because we have still uh, a lot of uh, speakers <coughs> waiting to uh, present their stuff uh, to you. So, but again, afterwards you can still uh, ask questions. Sven still is here. Next speaker. Hey, I hope you like this presentation. This presentation was held in the Brussels Data Science Community Meetup. If you want to know more of when these meetups are taking place, just check the link below. Bye bye.